Good morning, neighbors. Uh, it's so good to be with you guys this morning. Just enjoyed worship with you and uh, excited about uh, this week. Uh, I was actually supposed to be here last Sunday, but we had a family funeral, so we needed to run down to Florida. And uh, so Miss Betty came up and saved the day, and I heard she did a great job. And I heard a lot of social media shout outs, so I went and watched it on YouTube. And, uh, and it was really helpful, I think. Hopefully, uh, like me, you're trying to practice the pause this week as you uh, meditate on what she said. But other than the funeral, it's been a pretty good week at the Squire House. Our, our oldest son, Drew, uh, just got back on Friday from Big Stuff Camp with 70 middle schoolers and high schoolers from South Point Church. Yep, sounds like we had some parents or some kids there. And uh, it was an amazing week there at the beach. Uh, 13 of the 70 kids that went from South Point Church uh, crossed from death to life and, and decided to follow Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And so, yeah. Yep. So Big Stuff is not just uh, an elaborate vacation. It is actual uh, soul work and that God has done so much there uh, over the years. And we're excited about that. Thank you for supporting uh, financially to help kids get there. Uh, my kid had a great time. And so I want to say thanks to our family ministry pastor, uh, Jen Curtis, and the volunteer team, volunteers that give a week of their vacation uh, to suffer for Jesus in Panama City Beach. We really, we appreciate you guys. All right. Uh, also on Thursday, my wife and I, Lindsay, we celebrated 15 years of marriage. And so, yes, if you know me, you know that like that's a big deal because I'm a knucklehead and uh, she's a very patient woman. Uh, 15 years went by like in a super flash. And so uh, can't believe how that works. But the other day we were talking about uh, all the places that we've lived over those 15 years. And um, I don't know where you started out in your first place. But if you don't have a time in your life when you look back at a place you called home and go, I can't believe we live there, I don't know if you've really lived. And so uh, for us, that was our first apartment in New York. Uh, we got married. I was still in college. And so uh, we were just up the road from New York City. Uh, and so the, the rents weren't quite as expensive as like upper, you know, the Upper West Side or anything like that. But for the price we were paying for our one-bedroom apartment, there should have been some more bedrooms around. And... Uh, and so our, our apartment unit was a part of a large house that at one point had been a nice house, but they subdivided it into seven or eight units. And uh, it, was, it was back by the main road. And the city had developed over the years just right in front of it. And so right in front of our house is a, an old strip center. And not like a good one with a Target or a, a, a Best Buy or anything in front of it like that. It, it was a, a discount grocery store where long before it was cool, you had to bring your own bags you know, that kind of place. And um, so just, just not the greatest environment. You had to go around the backside of that to get to our apartment. And the shopping carts would magically make 90 degree turns and hit our cars all the time. And it was just hard to find. But uh, the hardest part of that, that place was that it was built in the turn of the century. And so that meant the walls were really thin. And so uh, you could hear everything. Uh, and so our, our neighbors to our right were fine. They had a similar life as us. They were, we were busy. And you know, we were just trying to make it through. So we were living on love and double shifts at Chili's, just trying to pay the rent. And, uh, and so the other neighbors were like that. But our upstairs neighbors were entirely different. And I don't know if you've ever had these neighbors. Uh, I, think, I think we've got some, some footage of them. Uh, this is actual footage of my upstairs neighbors. So that was them. And I'll tell you what, man, between the fighting and the yelling and the making up and the, uh, the snooze alarms and the, the time they flooded our unit with their illegal washer and dryer, when I saw them in the parking lot, I just avoided eye contact. Like, I, I did not want another friend. I did not need to be their friend. So I don't know about you if you've ever had that neighbor next door or across the street or down the road. Uh, or maybe you've had awesome neighbors your whole life, and, and I'm really happy for you. Uh, but this week, we're, we're kicking off this series that's inspired by our friend, Mr. Rogers, right, who's famous for his invitation to everyone, uh, even those who, who didn't necessarily see the world he did, won't you be my, my neighbor, right? And the reason Mr. Rogers' neighborhood has endured for generations is that there's something in us that wants to understand the world around us and wants to, to know and be known by the people that live closest to us. We want to get out and explore. Uh, but it doesn't just happen, does it? In fact, as I've been preparing for this message for a couple weeks now, uh, I've actually gotten really bothered. Um, 
I've gotten defensive because, like, I'm a good guy, you guys. Like, I'm a great friend. I will do anything for anybody. I, I stop traffic to help people. I pick up hitchhikers even though I shouldn't. You know, like, I've led a dozen mission trips all over the world. I'm a good guy, but I'm a terrible neighbor. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not the worst neighbor, right? I, I do mow my lawn occasionally. I don't leave the Christmas lights on all year round. Uh, I don't shoot off fireworks at 2 a.m. on random Wednesdays like I found out in my new neighborhood. That's just what they do. Uh, but I'm a pretty lousy neighbor because if I'm honest, I, I just don't care, right? Like, I'm busy. Uh, I'm trying to raise a family and, and lead a church and uh, trying to live my life and... and I don't really have time to take notice of the people that God's put around me. And so confession time, uh, we've lived in our current house uh, in Lusby for two years. Two years. That's 104 Saturdays, 24 months, right? So in all of that time, I know exactly two neighbors on my street. In fact, I only actually know the first name of one of my neighbors. Uh, so I am totally unqualified to be giving this message, and, and God's been, been working on me as I prepared. Uh, now, I know all the kids, because our, our front yard and backyard is the, the neighborhood playground. Um, all you need is a, a swing set, a trampoline, and a freezer full of ice pops, and you will be the like, social landing spot for the kids. So I know all the kids, but I know none of the adults. And so before you judge me, I'm going to ask you to participate, and in your bulletin, you should have gotten a little card that looks like this. And it says, who is my neighbor? And I'm going to challenge you to do the same thing here. We're going to give you about a minute. And uh, your house is there in the middle. And I want you to think about your eight closest neighbors, right? And here's what I want you to do. Uh, on the top, I want you to, or yeah, on the top, just say their name. Do you actually know their name? There should be a slide for this. Next one. Keep going. There we go. John and Cheryl Smith, right? So put their name. Next, tell me anything you know about them. It could be like you learned it from their bumper sticker on the back of the car, like the, the daughter goes to Frostburg, or they're into World Cup soccer or whatever. And then go one layer deeper and tell me, do you know anything about these people that you would only know if you actually talked to them? All right? We'll give you about 30 seconds to, to give, your, give your best try. All right, so how'd you do? Let's brag in front of everybody. Who here got all eight of your neighbors? All right. If you're watching this later, there's about five hands raised. And the good news is, guys, you're not alone. Um, that this, this exercise has been done many, many times, and um, less than 10% of people can name the eight people around them. Uh, it goes to 5% for the next level that can name anything about their eight neighbors, and less than 2% can name something that they would only know if they actually talked to them. And so now you're going to ask, hey, Kyle, why does this matter? Like, aren't we here to talk about Jesus? And who cares if I know my neighbors, right? Like, I have enough friends. They don't seem to need anything from me. Why are we, why are we doing this? Uh, can't we just stick to the smile and wave, right? We all do that, smile and wave, for years. According to Jesus, the answer is no, we can't. We can't just stick with that. Uh, so in the gospel accounts of Matthew and Mark and Luke, there's uh, three different eyewitness accounts of Jesus encountering uh, a group of, of religious leaders uh, that are there to, to hear Jesus speak. But they're not there to learn from Jesus. Uh, they're there just to, to see if they can hear something that they can use against him later. And so uh, they're, they're trying to trick him into saying all kinds of things. So they ask him about uh, all the things that we love to talk about, government and taxes and theology and all those things. And they, and they couldn't stump him. And so we get to, to Matthew 22, and we're going to pick this up right here. It says, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together, and one of them, an expert in the law, tested him, saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the first, this is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it, Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And so there's a lot of context that we could get into here, and I'll, I'll keep it really brief. Uh, but, but most people know 
uh, even if you're not a follower of Jesus, that there's this um, kind of code of, of um, faith and, and conduct called the Ten Commandments, right? And so these Ten Commandments, most Christians can only name three or four, but by golly, we believe all ten, and we're trying to do our best to, to follow them. Uh, and so those came out in the very beginning of the, of the Bible as, as God was uh, making the Israelites his own special people, and he gave them these ten rules. But then over the hundreds of years since then, uh, the religious leaders had added 600 more rules and regulations to those uh, 10 to help people kind of stay in line. And so uh, to ask this question, hey, Jesus, which one of those big 10 or which one of these 600 is the most important uh, is a great way to trip somebody up, right? Because it's hard to funnel it all down. Uh, yet Jesus didn't hesitate. Uh, he went right to this answer, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Uh, and that would have been well known at this time that um, the Jewish people then and even now is part of their daily ritual uh, that, that every day they pray these two prayers. Uh, the first called the Shema Yisrael, which is hear, O Israel, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Uh, and, and then the second is the, the Via Hatafa, the, sorry, Via Tafa, which is this, this response in Deuteronomy, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. They would have known that answer. Uh, but the curveball that Jesus threw was the and, right? It was the and, the second is like it. That instead of just giving a period and giving them the answer that they expected, he adds a comma or an ellipsis, a dot, 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 and he keeps going to say that, yes, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And if you do that, you're also going to love your neighbor as yourself. So they asked him for, for one, the greatest one commandment, and he gave them two and it's confusing to us because there's, there's two answers. But I think Jesus really lumped them together into one assumption, that to love God is to love our neighbor. And so in Luke's retelling of this account, which we're going to look into next week, uh, the, the, uh, the religious leader asks them to clarify. He, he, he listens to that answer and is intrigued. Uh, but he wants to know, hey, uh, wanting to justify himself and his actions, he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And you can almost see this guy pulling his card out and going, okay, like I'm a rule follower. Just tell me how many neighbors to, to love and I'll love those people. You know, tell me how far out of my neighborhood I need to, to reach. Uh, and so Jesus follows up with a, with a parable, a story with a point. And again, we're going to dig into this part next week. So the 15 second overview is there was a guy that was traveling down the road. He was alone. He was attacked by bandits, left to die on the side of the road, and three different people came upon this man. Uh, and the first two kind of heismaned him and went the other direction and kept moving on with their day. Uh, but the third guy, through great cost, through great inconvenience, to great danger to himself, uh, stopped and helped him. And so Jesus asked, hey, who do you think was the neighbor in this situation? And so the goal of that parable is to, to broaden our perspective on who our neighbor is, that it's not just those who share a street address with us or a zip code, um, but that God wants us to have a heart for those who are disconnected and in need. But in doing that, uh, in expanding our view, and in, and in uh, demanding that we look beyond ourselves, uh, Jesus actually makes an assumption. And the assumption is this, that like, hey, of, of course you're going to care for your immediate neighbors, right? Of course you're going to care about the needs and, and hopes and dreams of the people that are immediately next to you, but you've got to look beyond that, right? And so it's almost an inverse today, right? Like we, we look out to our, uh, our hypothetical neighbor, right? I'm really good at loving my metaphorical neighbor and, and um, doing all these things to serve people, but somehow in, in that I miss my like actual next door neighbor. And that leaves me going, hey, Jesus, who, who's my neighbor? Who is it that you're telling me I need to love? Because, man, you don't, you don't live next to Junkyard Bob, right? You don't live next to the, the nosy lady or the creepy guy or the stay-off-my-lawn guy, right? You don't, you don't live next to those people. And so when it comes to this idea of loving our actual neighbor, uh, there, there's three, three thoughts I want to leave you with. Uh, point number one is this. I can't avoid what Jesus assumes, 
right? Like Jesus assumed we're going to actually love our neighbors that are right next to us. And so if, if it's a given, if that's his minimum standard, that we're going to love the people that are right next door, then, then I have to start there. Number two is this, and it, it hurt my feelings when I wrote it, and, and I don't want to say it, but it's true. I can't love who I don't know. Right? I can't love who I don't know, because I'm, I'm not maliciously negligent. Right? We already said uh, I'm not trying to be mean. Um, but I've got a lot of excuses, I mean reasons for why I don't have time for my neighbors. Uh, I already said I'm busy, right? My life is a zoo. I've got three kids that all have their own things to get to. I'm trying to get Lindsay to stay married to me for another 15 years. Like, I don't have time to invest in my neighbors. Give me two more years and, and check back with me. Um, the second is my fear of rejection that I, I often talk about, right? Um, I can't tell you how many times I, I've met somebody in the neighborhood or at the ball field, and we start talking and uh, getting to know each other. And then inevitably, the, the, the guy question, the dude question, you, you get in like two minutes into the conversation is like, so what do you do, right? That's where we go. And, um, and so as soon as I mention I'm a pastor, it's like, oh, okay, whoosh, face drops. And you know that Homer Simpson gif where he like ghosts into the bushes? It's just like that. Um, <laughs> They're, they're like, they're like all, they either do one of two things. They get super spiritual, right? They're like, oh, like I, I went to church once, right? I'm the big man upstairs, right? Praise, praise God. They start getting weird, right? And then the other option is, again, they just like back away slowly, and they're like, all right, cigarette out, language gets cleaned up, and they just walk away. And so that's my problem. That's probably not your problem. Maybe, maybe for you, it's you just feel like you don't have anything to offer them, um, or you feel like your house just isn't, isn't welcoming, isn't a, 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 the place to have people over to hang out, um, or you just feel like you can't break into the neighborhood click, right? You're the new kid on the block. So whatever it is, man, I'm, I get it. Uh, we've all got our reasons. And then the last one is a little embarrassing as a pastor. Um, one of the reasons that I avoid my neighbors is because I've made unfair uh, or incomplete assumptions about my neighbors. Right? In our last house, at one point, uh, we had three kids under five years old, and so that's mayhem, right? Uh, and our next door neighbor was the stay off my lawn guy. And so uh, you can imagine that there was, there was conflict all the time when the kids would go chase a ball or when we'd have too many cars parked in the street because we had some friends over. Um, there was just always something that this guy wanted to complain about. And for the first few years, I was really frustrated because um, I was like, come on, man, like, we're just trying to live life. You stay on your side of the fence, I'll stay on mine. And, um, but as, as the years went by, I actually got to know him a little bit. I got to hear some of his story and understand why he is the way he is. Um, and it didn't make it, like, great. We weren't best friends. But it, it gave me a little bit more grace for him to understand uh, his values and, and what it was that he wanted. Um, but I had to take the initiative. I had to meet him in the middle. I had to take a step. Uh, Brene Brown uh, says it this way. She says, people are hard to hate from close up, so move in. Right? People are hard to hate from close up. So get a little closer, because um, as you get there, you see like, they're not maybe who you think they are. And then point number three is that uh, loving our neighbors, loving people requires action. Uh, it doesn't just happen. Right? You can't wait for somebody else to initiate, uh, or you'll miss the opportunity to love God by loving your neighbors. Um, to add a little bit more tension to this, since I haven't already beat, beat us up, right? uh, let me say it another way. I, I think we break the greatest commandment when we don't move and when we don't act. That, that to live a life of passivity, uh, to live a life that doesn't engage the people that God's put around us, is maybe even sin, is, is, is displeasing against God, is, is against God's hope for our life. And so love takes action. So okay, I'm done with the beatings. We're, we're, we're through it. Now let's get to some how-to, some practical. Like, okay, how do I do this? How do I love my neighbor? Um, the first one is, is obvious. It's fill in the blocks. Know their names. Um, 
Dale Carnegie, who wrote that famous book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, uh, he said this. He said, remember that a person's name is to that person the sweetest and most important name in any language, the, the most important sound in any language, right? Uh, neurological research shows this, that, that the sound of our own name uh, creates a positive brain activity, a measurable positive brain activity. We are biochemically attracted to our own name. And so if you can move from, hey, bud, or hey, man, to, hey, Mike, then that'll go a long way. Uh, getting really real, it might be a little bit awkward, but you might have to go knock on the door across the street and go, hey, I know we've lived across the street for like 10 years, but I don't actually know your name. And um, I just, I just want to say my name's Kyle, and if there's anything I can do to serve you and your family, I uh, would love to do that. Let me know if there's you know, anything I can do for you, right? Like, that's awkward. And there's a chance that they might answer the door and go, you're right, you don't know my name because I never told you. Have a good day, right? <laughs> really unlikely, though. Most likely, they're going to go, you're right. I knew your name a long time ago, but I forgot. You know, I'm Mike. Great to meet you. And you can go from there, right? Simple beginnings. Start small, uh, which leads me to step number two, which is start simply. Maybe move the grill from the backyard to the front yard. Um, throw a couple extra burgers and dogs on there, right? A couple extra brats and Bud Lights are not going to break the budget. Just be, be a welcoming neighbor in your front yard. Be available for people to see you and to engage with you. Uh, create opportunities. And then if there's something that you can do to practically serve your neighbor, do it, right? Uh, but be careful with this. Like a few years ago, you know, I mentioned that we had don't uh, get off my yard guy on my one side. On the other side was welcome to the jungle guy who never mowed his lawn. And so one day I decided I'm just going to keep going because it's only like a quarter acre and I'll, I'll mow his front yard. I won't go in his backyard because that's weird, but I'll mow the front yard. And I did that and I got the weed eater out and I'm going what used to be a flower bed of some kind. And I looked down, and I realized there's something tangled up in the head of the, the weed eater. And so I bend over to like, pull out what I think is a weed or something. And I realize it's a wire. And I had accidentally cut through the low voltage lighting uh, of this guy's little flower bed. Now, he assured me it was probably maybe he thinks broken before, so don't worry about it. Um, but, but certainly it undermined my intention, right, which was to serve him in a practical way, uh, and I think I created more work. Um, but if there is a way that you can serve them practically, then do it. Uh, maybe if you already know a couple neighbors, you can organize uh, a small block party. Again, keep it simple. People bring their own stuff. Um, just hang out, bring out the corn, cornhole boards or the volleyball net, and just see what happens. You don't have to program it. You don't have to make a speech. Um, just invite the neighbors to hang out together. To move, uh, so on the back of the sheet, right, there's, there's three steps to the relational roadmap. To move from stranger to acquaintance to friend. So to move from a stranger to acquaintance, you just need to know each other's name, right? But then beyond that, to move the next step takes a little bit of effort. And so this is the hard one. Uh, step number three is to invite them into your life. Right? Don't wait to, to be invited into theirs. Invite them into what you're already doing. And so stick with food, right? Hey, uh, Mike, we, we made a bunch of barbecue. Why don't you guys come over if you don't have any plans and hang out? You don't need to bring anything, right? Short, easy, simple, personal. Um, or maybe would you consider hosting a six-week small group from South Point? That as you, Elisa said amen from the back. And... Uh, so maybe you would host a six-week small group, and as people show up at your house every Tuesday night, your neighbors would be curious and go, what's, what's the deal with that? And you would be surprised that there are people that are maybe willing to go to your house and hang out with people from church um, that will do that before they'll actually show up here on a Sunday morning. And so maybe, maybe that's an answer of uh, open a small group. And then the last one takes some humility uh, because we're like do it ourselves, but People love to feel needed or helpful, and so ask for help. Uh, if, if you have a neighbor who's really into cars, ask him to help you like, learn how to change your brakes. Uh, or uh, if there's a lady that does a really great recipe, 
then go ask her for it and tell her about what it is that you need it for and then shut up and listen to her and she'll tell you about whatever she thinks is important, right? Simple, small, personal. Uh, knowing your neighbor is step one to loving our neighbor. And so get to know their names, start simply, and then invite them into your life. Really practically, here's what this looks like to go from stranger to acquaintance to friend. It, it looks like when you're walking the dog going, hey, hey, smile and wave, right? Step two is, hey, I'm Kyle, right? Oh, you're Mike? Great, okay. Step three, hey, Mike, how's your day going? Step four, hey, Mike, I saw your son move back in. How's that working out? Great, cool. Step five, uh, hey, can you help me move something in my garage, right? So maybe the last step, you guys want to come over and hang out and have dinner, right? It, it, it doesn't have to be elaborate. It's not uh, super secret. It's just practical steps one at a time, uh, maybe over six or 12 or 18 months that you can move towards being a friend to your neighbors. Uh, as we close, this quick poll of the audience, uh, who moved here from outside of the area? Right? The majority of the people in the room. Right? And, and this is what happens when people move to Southern Maryland, is they look around, they go, oh man, it is it's beautiful, Chesapeake Bay and uh, Four Seasons and all that stuff plenty to do for the kids, but there's like, there's no stuff, right? And, and you get short timers notice, right? Where you go, hey, we're only here for two to three years, so let's not, let's not worry about connecting with people, let's not worry about uh, taking next steps, because we're going to be out of here in a couple years. But what if God has you in this exact place for this exact time for the exact people that he's put around you? Acts 17 says it this way, uh, from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he's not far from any of us. And what that's saying is you're uniquely gifted to practically share the love of God uh, in a way that makes sense to your neighbors. Uh, and you don't have to be weird about it. In fact, please don't. Don't like have a barbecue and then try to tell everybody the four spiritual laws and ask them what happens when you die. Like, that will not go well. They will not come back. But just live your life in a way that is humble and kind and gracious and makes people feel valued without an agenda. And then let God do what he does. And as you love God with all your heart and soul and mind, and, and you just love your neighbors with that same kind of intentionality, um, they're going to notice. The Bible says that, that people will see your good works and give the credit to God because they, they realize it's, it's bigger than you. And so our neighbors, they're not projects. People aren't projects, right? People have stories. They have a soul. They matter to God, um, but it's not our job to fix them. And so what if we just took Jesus seriously, that the greatest commandment, the thing he cares about most, is just to love him to the best of our ability and to love the people around us? There are more than 1,000 families here at South Point Church or, or individual households, 1,000 individuals and families that what if, what if we all took our card and we decided together, we're going we're gonna to care about our aid. I can't, I can't love everybody. That doesn't work. That's cute. It's a good bumper sticker. But, but I can love, I can care for eight people, right? What if, what if a thousand households cared for the eight people around them? That's 8,000 households. That's tens of thousands of people. And, and to me, that feels like it's a lot more useful than, a, than a, an HOA or a neighborhood watch. That feels like something that, that God can use to do big things. All right? Let's pray. Father, so grateful um, that, that you moved into the neighborhood, that the Bible says that, that when we were far from you, that, that you put on skin and you moved into the neighborhood and became uh, our God and our friend. And so, um, God, I pray that we'd just be motivated 
to, to not just love our, our, our theoretical neighbor, um, but that we would look to our actual next door neighbors and ask the question, God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to live in a way that will just care for people and let them know that there's a God who cares about them? I pray that, that as we care about our eight uh, and the people that you put on our hearts, God, that we would we'd be bold. and We maybe knock on that door or stop at the mailbox and, and talk to that person and just take the first step to get a name. And I believe, God, that as, as we care for our neighbors, um, that, that many of them will come to know you, not because we preached at them, um, not because we gave them a tract or a Bible, but because we simply loved the way that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.